Is this a test to see if I'm having a stroke or is nobody talking? Oh, it might help if I turn my microphone on. I love it. Hey, y'all, and welcome to the Poker Insider Space. We're excited for all of you to meet our guests tonight. Until, until then, we would like to remind everyone of our past that our past spaces have been recorded. So if you've missed them, you can find them on our Twitter accounts, including last week's recording of Dara O'Kearney. Now for a word about our sponsor, Elevator Results whose purpose is to provide a service to help people reach their desired fitness goals, whether it's to be gain weight, lose weight, or to improve their sports performance, elevated results can help you reach your goals. Our guest, Barry Levy, was born in Brooklyn, New York, has a best life earnings of over 169000 according to the Hendon Mob, with a best live cash over 21,000, which was for his performance in the 2010 LA Poker Classic 08 tournament. Barry has served as a tournament director for over 20 years for various charity organization, organizations, such as the Allen Houston Foundation, the Michael J. Fox Parkinson Foundation, and the Illinois Holocaust Museum, to name a few. His appearance in the documentary allegedly touches on his involvement with the poker scene in the New York City area, which includes many poker clubs like the Mayfair, PlayStation, Straddle, and the Aquarium. Please help me welcome two poker insiders and, you know, poker insiders and Spaces favorite, Barry Levy. Nice to meet you. Is this mental health uh, fright? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I, I actually was pretty excited about this, Sherry, because, you know, Barry's been hopping around the spaces. We've, we've, uh, we've, we've heard the bit, of, as I was telling you earlier, I have this idea of uh, uh, the, the title of this show, I, I'd like it to be behind the bit because i want to i want to get to know barry like and, and that kind of thing but as always barry we're we're all about whatever you want to talk about so um you know i just uh i was thinking that that would be cool to get to know you i think uh, you got a lot of stories to tell and that's what we're all about barry tell us what it was like playing at the you know the early scenes of poker in new york like at the may fair or Mayfair Club uh, was it like when we play home games in Georgia there's a sense of um, you know allegedly um, we play home games in Georgia um, there's sometimes a sense of um, lack of security or you know waiting for the bus to happen was that sort of the mindset for you guys no the further you go back it was evolved over the years it was always a, a well-known secret, you know, where the games were, where the clubs were. The Mayfair was a, a backgammon club, and you know, we played short cards, gin, and stuff like that for decades before poker was popularized there. And as it started getting more and more popular, they had to make more and more upgrades, glass doors, security, things like things like that. I didn't find my way into Manhattan till probably the very early 90s. And most of my time was spent in Brooklyn for the first 15 years before I ventured into the city. And maybe 10 years in, I ventured into the city. And uh, then probably early 2000s, I started working, quote unquote, full time in all those underground game games from PlayStation and all the different clubs. So when you were working, were you dealing? Were you, you know, running the money? What were you doing? What was your part? Allegedly. <laughs> yeah, allegedly. Well, in Brooklyn, it was different because there was like really dirty, you know, whether you want to say mobsters and underground and, you know, you had to duck ashtrays and things and who was cheating and 
you know, a lot of unscrupulous behavior, you know, way back when, as it started, when I moved into the city, that's when you really, that's when you started getting paid, so to say, because you'd work in Brooklyn in the underground games, you'd make 2000 for the night, you, you wouldn't get $10, you'd come back the next day, they would hand you a rack of chips and say, jump in the game. And, and that's how it was for like the first decade of the Brooklyn scene of poker. So you mentioned cheating, you know, without giving anybody any ideas. What what types of things did they do to cheat? Well, back in, they, in those days, the, the deck would be passed around the table and everyone, you'd deal, deal yourself. So there was no such thing as dealers. So I eventually was able to hear the way someone shuffled the cards, the way they pitched, if they were taking too much time or they, you know, the snap of the card, to hear if there was any type of unscrupulous activity that was going on. So came in handy over the years. I think that's interesting. Like you almost get a second sense, right? Like for the tempo being a little different or the sound or the movement or, you know, when you see it so many times. I, right, I, I mean, I, go ahead. I, 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 I think we talked, uh, I don't know if you were on one time, we were talking about this time at uh, one of the Vegas casinos where this lady sat down and she was, uh, she was in the one seat and um, she was the big blind folded around to her. I, I, I mean, everybody, whatever, the action was on her. The dealer, instead of uh, waiting for her, starts to deal the flop and burns the card, rips out the three, takes them and then lifts, lifts the bottom card up and, and it lifts the card up to turn it over. And as soon as she gets it to where only that lady could see it, the lady goes, I didn't go, you know, <laughs> it was just so out of, out of character, you know, like, I mean, but it was very kind of quick, you know, I mean, a little more obvious than probably a lot of the things, but the thing that got me very was I, I asked, uh, I said, I said, well, she can, she, it's the action still on her, but those cards are getting shuffled back. And, and these people, they were supposedly two, two dealers, right? She says, no, 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 it's okay. I didn't see it. <laughs> and then my <laughs> alarm bells went off. You know, I'm like, you guys are dealers. You don't know what's supposed to happen here. You know, like get the floor, you know, but all, of a sudden, yeah. all of a sudden they want to go by the honor system. Yeah. <laughs> I just trust the lady turned over. Seat one turned over pocket aces at the end of the hand. I was done with that table, <laughs> by the way. I'm not sure wow. what they were doing. I don't know why you would show her the cards if you had aces, but anyway, so. Wow, that's incredible. Barry, where is your favorite place to play poker these days? Outside of any home game that allegedly happened around town. Yeah, these days I like the Seminole Hard Rock in Port Lauderdale. It's, they, run, they run good tournaments down there. It's a nice place. They let me scream and be loud and be crazy. So I like it there. Awesome. And, and do you play, do, I noticed on your Hens and Mob, which the first entry for you was, I think, back in 2002, um, you play a lot of mixed games. Um, do you prefer the mixed games over No Limit? Or are you just sick? You know, some people just say they're tired of No Limit. Well, uh, I started back, you know, I guess if we don't count around the kitchen table with your friends in the 70s, you know, 1990 was my first time in a underground poker club. And all it was was five card stud and seven card stud. And, you know, it was either with a spit card in the middle or without one. And they played for cash. There was no chips, no dealers. And the money would just pile up on the table. And I was charged with running that club. And, you know, back in those days, uh, they paid me $10 per table per hour, and I would walk in, and there was minimum always seven tables going. So I never had a reason to leave. All right. I just, I just, you know, if I ever got tired, I'd lay down four chairs, sleep for a few hours, wake back up, and I was back on the clock. The only problem was I was forced to play in those games. And though I know an ace, knew an ace from a deuce, I really didn't know how to play poker. And as much money as I was making, I was just losing. You know, they would throw people out to try to get me into the game. Oh, Barry's here. And this was, 
it was uh, expensive lessons back in those days. But eventually I learned. Right. And, I mean, you have to learn, you learn or you quit. So tell and, us, you know, a little bit more about how you got into poker, Barry. I originally, back in the early 80s, you know, I always had trouble deciding what I want to be when I grow up. So when I graduated high school in 81, I went to college for to take up law, but those books were so fucking heavy. I lasted one semester and gave that up and decided to go to school for computer programming. And I did that for a year. And that was, I started smoking pot at that time and had zero attention. And back in those days, you know, the computer programming language is basic, Cobalt, Fortran, and they, they programmed computers with punch cards. And the computer was it. Yeah. No, wait a second, Barry. Go. They were ch- chiseling Fortran into rocks. <laughs> like seriously? Yeah, that was 1982, and uh, that that didn't seem like That's it was wor- working out too well. Yeah. So I ended up uh, going into the car business, so accessories, car alarms, auto glass, window tinting. And did that for almost a decade in Brooklyn. You almost sounded like a salesman when you just gave that little synopsis of what you were doing in Brooklyn. <laughs> you could tell that was your pitch. ASG, what you got for us, bud? Yeah, so um, in these alleged games in New York City, what's the most ridiculous advertised rake that you've seen? Uh, not counting the amounts that they'd... Uh, Palm outside of those advertisements. Well, now I mean, so I sent you pictures. I mean, those games are crazy. They, they tell you it's ten percent, five hundred max. So they're literally telling you that they're chopping five hundred dollars per hand. Oh my god! So if that's what they're telling you, wow. you can't imagine. You can't imagine what what's really happening. What's what they're really taking? Holy smokes! And back, you know, wow. yep. After I spent that decade in Brooklyn, all I did was pretty much, you know, I, I ran that club till it closed, and then I, I became a dealer. And I was going around dealing all these places, and they would call me up in the middle of the night when there was too many chips on the table, and they needed me to break the game. So they called me the game breaker to come in and make sure I could get the chips off the table as quick as possible. And, and that was my uh, forte. You were the hammer man. Bringing down the a- the axe, you were the axe man. <laughs> it was like that? like hungry, hungry hippo. <laughs> <laughs> the hatchet man. Go ahead, Brian. How did the documentary come about? That was a friend of mine who obviously thought too much of himself and decided to fund the project to follow him around because he got caught up in a couple of pinches in two thousand. Seven, there was a, a sting that happened between two major clubs, uh, the Fairview and the Straddle. And the story was, what they tried to sell us, was that they were paying off the police for protection. And I never believed it. I never thought it was possible. And one night, 15 table joint, and the, the bell rings, and we see cops in the elevator, and we got to let them up. Oh, and like, my gosh. Five cops walk in, and they just walk in, they look around, they don't say anything, they walk back towards the door, they get on their phone, and they're just standing there for like a half hour, and then like oh my gosh, ten more detect- detectives show up, and yeah. they just and they're just standing there and they're talking, and then you see the guys that that with the white the cops with the with the white shirts and the blue hats that they stand behind the mayor at the press conferences. They show up and nobody's in handcuffs. Nobody's getting <laughs> nobody's getting arrested. Like I'm seeing this and, and I, I can't believe this fucking shit is happening. And they have is anybody sit- trying to cash out while this is going on? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be no. out the back door. I got so many of those stories. So and then like this is going on for like an hour and a half, and they go to one of my bosses and they tell him 
when we walked in, there was 60000 in the drawer. and Just signed this paper to say when we're leaving, there's 60000 He signed the paper, and they, all the cops just left. And we continued to play poker. <laughs> so, so now I'm convinced that they are paying off the police. Right. Because how is something like this in 2007? It's not like the 40s or the 50s. Right. Like, and it turned out to be uh, some type of undercover sting operation. But they were setting them up, you know, they weren't taking this money, buying Christmas presents for their kids. You know, they were building a case. All right. And then everyone ended up getting indicted for that. Not me, but, you know, everyone I knew. Now, we all wow. know, you know, we've all learned in the spaces that you are a original New York tough guy, Brooklyn tough guy. So I want to know if there was ever a time you were at one of these games that you were that you were afraid? Well, I don't know a tough guy, but I mean, in 2010, there was 2010, 2009, there was an incident where the security team told their friends about a game and they showed up with shotguns and handguns and, and robbed the place and the gun actually accidentally went off and killed the guy. Wow. And, that, and that pretty much ended poker in New York as it was. There was no wow. more no more clubs, no more everything. We all scattered to individual apartments. I scattered to a doorman building on the Upper East Side, and all the games started to break up because people didn't want to get killed. Like, playing poker is not worth it. Right. That's scary as hell. So just the thought of it, the aftermath was pretty scary. Oh, my oh. God. Were, were you always tearing up? cards and setting them on fire or, or when did you start realizing hey it's my game I can do this now yeah well, some of it was uh, entertainment purposes some of it I just blew a gasket and you know it depends what year it was I could pinpoint when I fell off my loop and fucking lost my mind over stupid things so but yeah that was a lot of entertainment value I was always the entertainer always the loudest one try to you know, the, the whole misdirection thing to take big people not realize how much they're losing or that they're losing and shit like that. Here's the magician. What is, your, fond, what is your fondest memory of poker? Like, what is the one thing or several things that you've gotten out of poker um, that has surprised you has surprised you as a benefit of being in the poker world. Well, it took me from from uh, you know eating out of garbage cans to the highest level of government. You know, rubbing elbows with billionaires, and so a lot of different accomplishments. Raising two million dollars a year for charity for the last twenty years. So a lot of, a lot of pluses to what I've been doing. That's amazing. Uh, congratulations on that charity work. I'm a big proponent of charity work, so that is amazing. Donna, go ahead, love. Yeah, have you all have you always been able to do these one liners that you come out with? Because you're known as the one liner guy. Yeah, sometimes you know, I I think I was probably sharper before this joke. Now I've been recovering from the brain fog, I guess, but. Yeah, I like to have fun and I like to be entertaining and sometimes I cross the line but I really usually don't care. Yeah, we know. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we love you so because you know you come in hot. It's usually funny as hell. My sister had asked me a few weeks ago, she's like, Since the stroke, do you think you lost your filter? I'm like, when did I ever have a filter number one? And probably a little bit. Not in a bad way. You're always coming from the right place with your heart, Barry. Um, nobody can deny you that. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I Like, these stories about these clubs and stuff like that, like, I could listen to you all day, honestly. Um, like, um, what what are some some other stories that you have from back in the day? Uh, in 2004, I spent like from 1990 to 2004, 2005 in Brooklyn, and then I moved into the city 
And that introduced me to, I guess, what you'd say a higher class of player, allegedly. And that's where I started meeting these hedge fund guys. And I got brought to Trump Tower to deal in a game that was run out of there. And in one of the scenes from the movie Molly's Game, when her lawyer is arguing with the two prosecutors and they, they mentioned something, you know, a real life thing that uh, Barack Obama was trying to get this guy to be the ambassador to Ecuador. But the Secret Service went through his, his, his books and saw there was checks, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000. And they questioned him and he says, no, I won playing poker. Why is that a problem? And they're like, it's not a problem. It's who these checks are from. And, you know, alleged Russian mobsters that were about to get indicted. So he had to withdraw his, his nomination. He ended up buying the Milwaukee Bucks. So that was talked about during Molly's game. And not a bad, not a bad trade off, I'd say. Yeah, I think two years later they won the championship. So, yeah, I'm sure he was happy. <laughs> I'm sure he was. Welcome to the show, Slay. Go ahead, bud. Slay, you there? Oh, you want me to go? Yes. <laughs> Barry Lee. Hey, Barry, what part of New York did you grow up in, young man? Coney Island. Coney Island. Okay. Coney Island, baby. Are you a Lou Reed fan? Yeah, but not uh, more of a Springsteen. And then, obviously, you know, okay. you're... Long Island, Billy Joel, you know, that kind of movie. Yeah, I love Lou Reed. That's why I was wondering. He's got that song. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I was coming up to support Barry, you know, big fan. I'll try to think of some questions. I don't really know enough about Barry to question him. You know what well, I mean? He's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a mystery to me. But well, I that's why we're here. But I should know, and I've probably seen him around over the years. Did you ever play at Foxwoods, Barry? Yeah, I have. What was it, uh, 1993 when they opened poker? Yeah. yeah, I was pretty much probably there day one. I was there before day one when it was just high stakes bingo, and you had to walk walk through the mud to get to, get to those airplane hangers to play the bingo. So I, rem I remember those days. I'm bringing up uh, Richie. Go ahead as soon as you can hear me, bud. Richie, do you have a question or comment for Barry? I do. Okay, go ahead, Bree. Welcome. Barry, you said you um you and somebody else owned a strip joint back, back back in the day. I did what? You owned a strip joint? No, I, I keep getting muted. Uh every time I talk I the mute button goes on. Okay, no Matt, can you hear me, bud? Richie, can you hear me? I don't think he can hear us. I don't think he can. Or software, see if you can get, if he can hear you, software. Can you hear me? Uh, get your shit together. Seriously, Nomadic. bro. Nomadic. <laughs> Richie. Nomadic, are you there? No. He needs to go out and come back in, but he doesn't know that. So, sorry, Bree, go ahead. He might interrupt you again, love. You yeah, Bree, back in those days, they were called lap dance clubs. You know, lounge lounges. They didn't really want to be called strip clubs. You know, for whatever legal purposes that went with that. Did you have any way or like certain way of like running your the girls or anything? I'm just curious. It was always a house mom for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Barry, you never uh, married? I never married. I was in a 12 year prison sentence relationship. <laughs> no kids. Uh, no, she had two from a previous. So once that was, I was done with that. I was already in my mid forties, doing the midlife crisis thing. I, you know, had a twenty-year-old and a twenty-five-year-old girlfriend, so I didn't need that stress in my life. Yeah, I had my midlife crisis a little early. I hope I'm not going to have another one. I don't know. I think you're ready to I've take like on four. the world slay. Yeah, yeah, I got my shit together much better than I did. I think you're ready, bud. I had like a five-year midlifer. It was fun, though. I think you're ready. Okay, Bobby, go ahead. Then we'll go to Donna. These guys are talking about midlife crises. I am balls deep in it right now. <laughs> no fucking fun. 
the good news is if this too shall pass, Bobby. Did you have a question for Barry? Uh, I actually did have a question for Barry, but I have since forgotten it. Uh, Flay asked, a, or Bree asked a good one, and I kind of lost my train of thought. I'll be back in a second. No worries. Go ahead, Donna. And by the way, Richie, I've been trying to invite you. If you can hear me, go ahead and send a request, bud. I'm sorry, Donna. Go ahead, Donna. It's quite all right. Barry, how long have you been involved with the charities that you've been involved with? And how did you get involved with um, the MJ one? The Michael J. Fox one. Uh, so when I moved out, when I left Brooklyn and started working in the city, like 2004, 2005, that's when I was introduced to charity poker scene. And the guy who was running PlayStation at the time always got these events, and I was always his right-hand man. So then I forgot what year, what year it was. He suddenly had a brain aneurysm and passed away. And one of these tournaments were fast approaching. So I went to them and I says, you don't even have to pay me. Pay me as a dealer, whatever you want. Just give his wife whatever he was supposed to get. And I'll make sure the tournament runs without a hitch. And they did that. And they paid me anyway. And I've been doing it for them ever since. And that's pretty much the biggest one. Uh, Math for America. They rent out the St. Regis every year. They raise nearly $2 million for math and science teachers. So pretty proud of that one. That's amazing. Great job, Barry. That's so cool. Have you played poker outside of the um, United States? Uh, not outside the United States. I traveled to somewhere maybe 2010 when, you know, after Frank died and all the clubs closed, I moved into a doorman building in Manhattan and decided to travel the country. And I did like 10 stops. And wherever I went, I final table, except, except Indiana. So it was, you know, fun, but all over the United States, but not out. I, I left the country once back then. I went to Brazil, and I didn't think they were going to let me back in. So I stopped leaving the country after that. Yeah, it gets tricky, especially when you're trying to carry some poker money with you. Um, you know, as we see, even till today, there's issues in Spain with that. And uh, down in, a, isn't it Aruba? that there was an issue about that and you got to be careful when you're carrying that cash. Even traveling across the country, you know, yep. if you're driving, they take your car, they take your money, it take you 10 years to get it back. And usually you don't. That actually happened to a friend of mine. He was traveling with a group of guys just going, like you said, from city to city, you know, tournament series to tournament series. And they got pulled over and, they had lots of cash, and it was confiscated. It took six months to get their money back. You know, it's not it's not easy, but um, maybe one day they'll have those laws figured out for us. I don't know. Nomad, go ahead. Try it again, Got you. Sorry. Yeah, I think it was glitched from before. Sorry about that. Uh, no worries. I might have missed it, but uh, hey, Barry, has a game you've ever been involved in been held up or robbed, and were you there at the time? Uh, no, not uh, not while I was there. Gotcha. I've I've seen some video of a few. Gotcha. Just, you know, every, everything's all wired up. You know, we see it after the fact, but yeah, just just a lot of raids and things like that. Gotcha. Yeah, raids. Figured you've been involved in those. Uh, well, we know you have. But uh, I was wondering. It seems like a lot of these games, these undercover underground games, do get robbed relatively often. So uh, glad to hear you weren't involved in any of that because uh, sometimes those can get they can be dangerous. So. Glad to hear that. It's perfect. Yeah, so the summary here. So, Barry, you're just like basically you're like a poker player and a criminal. What else? Uh... He's a fundraiser. <laughs> He's a, he doesn't have <laughs> No, I'm just joking. I'm joking, Barry. <laughs> you throw hatchets before he called me an incel, so I had to call him a criminal. You know? Reco recovering drug addict. We didn't get into that one yet. Oh, God, are you really? Which, which drugs were we uh, addicted to? Well, garbage, garbage can, but heroin mainly. Well, I'm glad you're still with us, brother. Yeah, I quit. I'm, 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 
I quit in 88, and then, like a good addict, I switched addictions and found poker. <laughs> well, at least it's like that long ago. Huh? That long ago, wow. Yeah. Well, it's a little safer. Poker's a little safer. Yeah. Nomad, I like Not the for show some last... Nomad, I liked the show last night. I, I heard some of it. Pretty, uh, pretty yeah, entertaining. Well, thank you guys, but this is about Barry. I, I mean, I appreciate that. Yeah, a lot of sharp betters. A lot of sharp betters on there. Okay, well, yeah. relax, Slay. You just wanted to get paid, too. You didn't get paid. It's all right. <laughs> uh, get paid by some scam app? No. Get the fuck yeah. out okay. of here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't Corby's let that guy anywhere near me. Uh, you guys can Donna has a question. Keep playing. Or oh, it's just Slay. This is, this is what you get. Anyway, um, sorry, Barry. Go ahead. We're just going to keep on moving. Go ahead, Donna. Are you glad that you found spaces and you found us nutters? Well, before before there was a such thing as spaces, there was something called Clubhouse. And uh, once the pandemic rolled around, I was able to find refuge there. And, you know, it's just social audio app. And I was in those rooms basically for the crypto space. And, you know, with all my friends, the, you know, the far right anti-government anarchists, you know, the storm in the Capitol crew, you know, I, I was in, into that for a while with, with those guys. But uh, aside from storm in the Capitol, they're, they're really nice guys. So that's all I can say. <laughs> Oh, your one-liners keep us uh, having fun in the spaces. Go ahead, Brian. Crazy. So, so what's the craziest thing that you've ever seen happen at one of these pubs? I mean, I mean that that one story you told is, is pretty crazy. Cops walking in and just hanging out like you're. Uh, Mind had to be like a little crazy with that whole thing. Yeah, and then it would be the you know they'd come back three months later and they would find ten people to arrest, and then a month later they'd come back and wouldn't arrest the same people even though they look you dead in the face, knew you by name but wouldn't arrest you, and they would find eight other people to arrest, and it would be like, ah, give him a break, give him a break this time, and you know. Another set of guys would have to go through the system. You know, it got tires, tiresome and old after a while, but that's why I always went to work with a sweatshirt in case I had to go through the system. I would be able to roll up a pillow for myself and get comfortable on the floor. How many times did you get put through the system then? Uh, I've been arrested probably 10 times, probably seven, six for poker. So should we go down the list, people? Thumbs up if you want me to go down that list. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, pretty Okay, Donna, yes, okay. So arrest number one, if you can remember, because I know you've had a stroke a few months ago. Arrest number one for poker. We'll just talk about the poker-related ones. What was arrest number one? Uh, that, that was probably 2007, the Fairview. I had a good run for a while. I, I really never got arrested for poker. I was either, you know, I showed up a half hour after the raid was happening or I was off that night or I was in Atlantic City and I would get a call. The club is being raided. So I ran, I ran good for a long time. And then I just, like, they had a low jack, low jack up my ass. I just kept getting arrested, like, month after month after month. And then I would see the same judge. It's a, my sentence would be stay out, you know, it's a violation, not a crime. Stay out of trouble for six months. And, like, a month later, I go see the same judge and he reads me the same thing. Stay out of trouble for six months and nothing will be on your record. It's like, you know, it was just a joke, really. Sort of the revolving door effect, eh? Yeah, the most I ever got was eight days community service, which 
it was more of a pain in the ass than anything else, but that was <laughs> it. So out of um out of the out of all the people that you've met, who prob who did, were you like fanning? Like were you in awe of when you got to meet them at a poker table or play with them? Well, it's I don't think I, I was always loved the entertainment and the movies and TV. So I don't know if I was ever really starstruck like that. But you know, I met Hank Azaria, came to play. It was nice to meet him. You know, all the poker people we all know. I played with pretty much all of them over the years. So never really starstruck over any of that stuff. But. Did Mainly, you have the opportunity to play with uh, Doyle? Yeah, in 2004, we'll say, there was something at the Sands in Atlantic City called the Million Dollar Deal. It was a $10,000 buy-in, a million dollars guaranteed for first place. And I think they had like 195 people. And if I recall, Negrano finished sixth and Matasau finished eighth or ninth in that particular tournament. I just looked it up a week ago, so that's why it's fresh in my memory. <clears throat> but you couldn't go around like 20 tables, like there was five pros at every table. So sure enough, Doyle Dor Brunson's at my table. Imagine that. And I'm watching him play a hand and the, like the flop, whatever, with the board was paired and I'm saying to myself, the guy, the guy fired out on the turn and I'm like, if Doyle calls here, he's fucking dead. And he called, and then the river came, and the guy fires out. I said, he can't fucking call here. He's fucking dead. And he put in some oversized, gigantic fucking raise. And I'm like, what is this maniac fucking doing? And he got the guy to call, and he turned over quads. I'm oh, like, yeah. snap. I'm like, yeah, I shouldn't be in this fucking game. It was a good <laughs> It was a good thing I, I won two seats to that tournament, so I was able to play one and sell one. So it was pretty much a 10K free roll for me. So it was fun good times in those you. days. That's amazing. That's a great story. And, you know, in honor of him no longer being with us, I try to ask everybody if they have a Doyle story, um, just because I know everybody enjoys a Doyle story. So thank you for sharing yours. And, um, you know, he had the goods. He had the nuts, uh, as they say, right? So go ahead, Brian. Brian, are you there? Press that microphone button. Thank Brian, you fell very asleep. much. I, no, I, I, I had a stroke, I think, or something. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> How is that funny? That is... Why is that a bit, Barry? That is not. That is not funny, really. So, so how's the uh, pirate? Uh, pirate? Uh, what is it? Cash out? Dollar pirate. Sign. Yeah, dollar uh, sign pirate two one two. Yeah. How how is that going? Have, have you uh, have you been able to uh, collect on that? Yeah, I mean, not as good as Slay's bit, but yeah, I collected about sixty four dollars so far. So that's that's fun every time that lights up. So. I love it. Now, 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 Barry, there was a guy in the spaces earlier this summer that talked about something with his parents and pirates and things. You, you, you didn't, you weren't, you weren't that pirate, right? Not as far as I know. I've, I've been a pirate for a long time, but I don't know uh, which pirate you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, crazy. There was but, a guy. Uh, there was a guy who dressed up as a pirate for the World Series of Poker, and he was the one who was pulling the bounties out. And he yeah. ended. He ended up getting banned because part of his costume were two fake guns. Yeah. And they, and they banned him for that. Came back mm -hmm. the next day with the guns and was like going to play, but they weren't real guns. I mean, I don't know. I think that what a weird deal. It's really like, unfortunate that you, our times have come to that. You have to be very careful in a casino. Yeah. And you do not want them to to uh, 
to look at you the wrong way for sure. So yeah, that guy's name. Times. That guy's name was Scotter. I don't know, Scott, uh, Scott with an ER, and his, sh- his shtick used to be when you would knock him out of a, a poker tournament, he had these little cars or these little tchotchkes that he would put the last of his chips and he would slide them over to, into the pot before he would bust. And if you busted him, you would get one of his fucking tchotchkes. I'm looking at one of his trucks right now because I busted him. You busted him. Ten years ago. That's so. awesome. Good for him for making poker fun. Go ahead, Don. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I I, I busted uh, Barry Greenstein back in the day when he he was giving out books and all that, and I busted him from the main event and got no book. Like I'm still kind of bitter about it. Barry. Can't imagine why he didn't gift you something when you busted him out of the main event. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> is that surprising, Sherry, or what? I just can't imagine why. <laughs> Go ahead, Donna. Sorry, you know I want you to write a book. Me too. Are you even contemplating about getting somebody that can help you write a book and get it out there and published? Because there's more stories to be had than just what you're saying on here. Yeah, I would have to dictate it. My brain is still scrambled, you know, just trying to get back to normal as we speak. So it would really have to be pulled out of me. You know what? For the record, Barry, I would help you with that. I would love to help you with that. No strings attached. You're so kind, Cherry. Thank you. That's nice. Thank so, you. So, okay, so this stroke thing is, like, legitimate, right? Like, I mean, you actually had a stroke? Yeah, it was April 25th or 26th. I woke up in the middle of the, middle of the night, like most 60-year-old men do, to take a piss. And I took a step off the bed, and my whole left side was numb. So I, I, I did what every normal level-headed thinking person would do. I hopped into the kitchen, made a cup of coffee, smoked a cigarette, <laughs> and said, let me go back to sleep. Maybe, maybe I'll feel better in a couple of oh, hours. Oh, God. Oh, my so goodness. A couple, couple hours later, I really wasn't feeling better. And I said, let me just have another cup of coffee, smoke another cigarette. So maybe I'll either go to the clinic, which was right across the street of the hospital, I could Uber to. So after about another hour, I decided to Uber over to the, hosp- to the hospital, and I got there. They took one look at me. They, they said, you're having a stroke. I said, you mean I had a stroke? They said, no, you're having a stroke. And they threw, wow. me, in an, threw me in an ambulance from there and sent me to Bellevue, where I had a wow. 100% blockage in my right carotid artery. Oh, my goodness. And you are so, so lucky to be here. The coffee saved your life, and the cigarette did too, probably. Oh, my gosh, Jerry. <laughs> Jerry, <laughs> no. They I'm said I was 50-50 to make it off the table. God. Wow. So, well, to, yeah. I mean, you, you probably were worse than that to make it there. I mean, my gosh. Like, I had no idea it was that serious. Like, that. that's... Um, God bless. I'm thankful that you, you, you made it through that. How how is your recovery going? Well, yeah, no drift, no droop. I mean, I lost my left peripheral vision in both my eyes, so my depth perception's a little off, and you know, I was a little wobbly at first, but I'm get, getting that back. So I think the brain fog is clearing. I mean, I still can't drive, so yeah, that's a problem. Well, well other than that, that you're doing much better. I'm glad to hear that. I haven't lost my sense of humor, so that's a good thing. Yeah, we know that yeah. too. <laughs> you haven't cancelled anybody for a while, Barry. Who's on your cancel list now? Oh, yeah, I cancelled Greg Locke and Tumbleweed. I had to block those two. I, I, just, I just can't stand these raging alcoholics that come and start spewing and and then, then they're belligerent, so they just got to get blocked. Even if it's a, a quick timeout, they need to be right put in their corner. 
Well, we so, all know that I'm no longer on that list, so thank God. Go ahead, Brian, <laughs> before I remind so, him. <laughs> yes, yeah, so so um, Bobby, how are you in here twice? What's going on here? <laughs> Maybe he remembered his question. Are you there? This is why I am looking up all right. I love it. I love because it. Because you are so quick with the comebacks and to say you've had a stroke yeah that's true you know, you know what I mean it, it's so sharp with everything so it's not affected your brain all that much and I'm just happy that you're still here yeah you wouldn't say that after my performance at the World Series of Poker I went 0 for 9 but that's probably a different story well tell it then no, that's pretty much it. I mean, I don't want to make anybody cry. I had the stroke in April, and in June, I was at the World Series of Poker, stumbling and bumbling and walking into people. Couldn't see straight, but, you know, could barely see across the table and went 0 for 9. But, well, you know what, though, Barry? I have to say that I think I would look at it differently that you were around to still be able to do that, and next year is going to be a better year. Yeah, a day at a time, whatever it is. Right. Have you played the main event, Barry? No, I played a few different 10Ks. You know, I like the mixed events, so 10K horse. And back in the day when there was only really no limit, you know, I played uh, a few of those, Foxwoods main events. So I was always satellite in too. But I kind of moved away from Holden. The, the kids got too good. Right. You know, during the internet boom, there was no way I was keeping up with that. I wasn't about to start playing online. You know, right. The older generation, we never trusted online. You know, put put our credit card on a computer. What are you fucking crazy? Well, we never... and you know what? You were right because look at all the scams online. But go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm saying so I never really got into that. You know. Yeah. And here we are. So, what would your wheelhouse be for buy-ins? Like, do you have like like, I know that um, Caitlin, she likes to play like a 1000 to $1,500 buy-in. So do you have like a wheelhouse for like what you prefer in, in buy-in levels? Yeah, well, uh, if I go to the World Series, you know, I'll play the, a few of the 1500s. Uh, you know, usually a 1500 horse, the 1500 Omaha high-low, there's a three-way Omaha, PLO8. So I play most of the mixed games. What what was the, your first uh, World Series? What what year ish? Do you remember or possibly two thousand nine, two thousand ten? Okay, that's cool. I looked up a stat about the World Series of Poker in nineteen ninety when I got into poker. There was a hundred and ninety four people at the World Series of Poker, and on is that crazy? Day, and on day three, Stu Younger was found un unconscious in his room, God never what? never made it back to the tournament, but he had so many chips, they blinded him off, and he finished ninth for 25000 wow. Yeah, I remember that story. That was yeah, 1990. I, uh, invite, uh, Jason's up on our panel. Jason, did you have a question or comment? I'm going to hit the speaker button, Jason. You're failing, Jason. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, can't, I can't hear some people. There, there, there you are. There, okay, there can you hear me, Jason? I couldn't hear Sherry. Uh, I was going to ask, what was your biggest cash win ever? But I can't hear you. Probably so old 22. I not work if I ask you a question. So you got, I got to leave and come back. Yeah. Yeah. Ask him if he can hear Barry. Hey, can you hear Barry? Yeah, he said he's got to leave and come back. He couldn't hear me. Yeah, I did. I, okay, no worries. He's going to leave and come back, and we'll go back to his question. So go ahead, Barry. What, what was your what was your biggest cash? Could have been a LAPC horse, probably twenty something thousand. I had a few of those twenty thousand dollars. It was twenty one thousand at the two thousand ten LA. Poker Classic 08 tournament. Yeah, 2010, 2011, I had some sort of sun run. 
you know, wherever I want, I would either win or final table. And nice. I want the Borgata. I won two tournaments in one week. Like Tuesday, I would I registered for the Omaha High Low tournament, and day two was Wednesday. I won Thursday. I registered for the horse. Friday was day two. I won. It was just like a sun run, you know, like the lucky slots. You know about that, Donna. Hell lucky. yeah, hot slots, baby, hot slots. All right, Jason, I think you came back. Let's see if we can all hear you. Yeah, no, thank you. Can you? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Cool. All right. I heard his answer, too, so that's awesome. Okay, perfect. Glad you came back to us, bud. Sherry Nomadic, I hear, is in on those lucky slots a lot. Like he, he runs, the, he runs the streaks. He, uh, he, you know, he does it. So yeah, he if offers you want to know about, course. yeah, and he offers yeah. a course. Don't forget to contact him about his course that you can take on <laughs> how to play hot slots and how to find hot slots. Just DM him. For more information, <laughs> yeah, this is a yeah, this is like a, the 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 commercials there, pretty good. What is that makes a it best class is he doesn't have a speaker. This makes it best. You can't snap back at me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you like that? <laughs> Love you, nomadic, and we're just kidding about the course. Don't anybody get upset about that. Yeah. It's not a course. It's a master class. <laughs> I didn't say that, nomadic. So. Did. <laughs> Oh, my God. I love it so much. Uh, anybody else that has questions or comments for um, our guest, Barry, please uh, request on the bottom left. Um, just a reminder about our sponsor that we're happy to have, Elevator Results. Um, if you need some help with your um, fitness or gain weight or losing weight or sports performance, reach out to Elevator Results. Donna. Barry, what's the best thing that's come out of your poker journey? I guess the, the people you meet along the way and you know, other friendships you make. and You meet all kinds of different people. You know, I've, I've met a who's, a, who's who, a who's who of across the spectrum of, you know, like I said, all walks of life from the lowest of the low, the highest of the high, and everywhere in between. Welcome, Neil. Neil, did you have a question or comment for Barry? Yeah, I was wondering uh, who his uh, favorite person is to have on the rail uh, watching him at these games. Great question. Yeah, it's always great to have a rail and have support, and you know, friends and family. My nephew, one of my biggest supporters. Always on the rail, so it's great to always have him. Does he play Barry? If you call what he does play, yeah, he, he's played. You know, he's had some deep runs over the years. I haven't played in a while. That's my nephew, by the way. Oh, Neil, I'm so glad you joined us. Yeah, I, ju I just wanted to say hello. That's Hi, awesome. Neil. Hey, Neil, nice to meet you. Nice yeah. to meet you. Uh, I'll stop interrupting. Yeah. You oh, guys, no. you, you you guys just pulled a scam on us. <laughs> well, you know where I get it from. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. and yeah, soon he'll be making a list of of hatchets. Um, go ahead, Jason. Um, six handed, no limit table, like your ultimate dream table of like superstar players. Who would it be? Great question. Yeah, I would. If it was in a casino, I would walk by it. Uh, it's, that's not for me. I, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I've I've played with everybody. I I was in a 10k horse one year, and they broke my table and they moved me into the small blind. And in my big blind is Phil Ivy. And I'm like, look at this fucking. How am I gonna play with this fucking guy on my left? And two <laughs> two hands in, he goes to war with somebody, and he's left with like four chips, like not even enough for his big blind. So the next hand, I'm the small blind. He's all in for less in the big blind. Obviously, it's folded around to me. I have to complete it, and I knocked him out. So that, that's, that's my claim to fame, I could say. I knocked out Phil, I, 
to live out of a tournament. Let's go. That's Let's awesome. Let's go, Barry. Hey, hey, Barry. I'm just going to say it sounded like you outplayed him in the hand myself. I think uh, I think you played perfect. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. Go ahead, Donna. I want to know what your take is on Alan Kessler. <laughs> Stir in the pot. Yeah, before, you know, the dusty, crusty, right. Before there was Alan Kessler, there was Joel Bagels, you know, the character from, the Kanish character from Rounders. And I think that's probably where Alan got his style from. Because this guy was the most, and the nicest guy you ever want to want to play with or meet because he knew how to be a tight ass but be friendly and talk people up at the table so he wouldn't get chased out of games. But he would drive from Brooklyn to Atlantic City and he figured out how not to pay the toll. So he would take the streets. It would take him like seven hours to drive there just to not to pay the toll. He didn't care. He would smoke pot the whole way there and he, just as long as it took, that's how long it took. And Typical poker player will put 10000 on a poker table, will not spend $5 on a damn toll road. That's typical. <laughs> but I really think that that's where they fashioned that, well, that Kanish character. I'm going to tell you, I think it's so interesting that you talk about the characters in Rounders because you know the characters in real life, and all of us are just in awe of the fact that you can literally name the real life person that that role is, um, is based on because you actually know the person. I think it's so cool. Well, no, nobody really knows who Mike McDermott was supposed to be. Like you could ask 10 people, 10 people, they'll all tell you it was fashion for them. Right. But I don't think Koppelman ever admitted to, who he fashioned it off. But, you know, he used to come to the Mayfair. And, you know, one day he walked in, he saw what was going on. He called up his partner, David, and said, you've got to come and see this. And in a few hours after that, they wrote Rounders, just from all the characters that they, uh, that, that they saw that, that night playing in those games. And I remember a couple of weeks later or a month later, six months, I'm playing in one of those games. And in walks Edward Norton, and he sits down, and he plays at the table I'm playing at. And it was fun. That was right after Primal Fear. So he was relatively unknown. No, nobody knew who he was. So good times. That's amazing. I just think it, I don't think, I mean, there's probably a handful of people in the poker world that can relate those, you know, other than just our imaginations, but, you know, that have actually played with the people that those roles could be modeled after. It's very interesting to me. Yeah, back in, you know, in the early days of, well, it probably wasn't the early days, but the early 90s of the Mayfair Club, it was the Howard Letterer and Phil Locke and, you know, what you would consider the whiz kids of, of that time. And, you know, after the game broke, whatever whatever time they threw us out, 4 a.m., they would go to the diner and sit there for hours and talk about hands and study and, you know, so that is it safe to say you didn't lose out on Black Friday? I was, you know, I, I didn't know there was a cash out button when it came to online poker. I just thought it was one way deposit only. <laughs> so I knew whatever I put in, I uh, was never going to withdraw. I mean, I fooled around. I was more interested in how are they cheating and who's cheating and what's going on here and this can't be on the level guys, five guys in a room in an office somewhere, you know, shit like that. You know, the expression, it's always the biggest thief who thinks he's getting robbed. So I was always concerned about all that fucking nonsense. Right, right. Okay, what you got, bud? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I know you've mentioned a bit about being in those uh, crypto communities. So, uh, yeah, did, did you get in on the ground four actually in crypto or did you just like to listen about it well 2011 black friday the, obviously you know everyone logged in and we all got that fbi warning and that summer i went to 
the World Series of Poker, and a friend of mine said, Barry, Barry, Bitcoin, it's $5. And I motherfucked him up and down, and only an imbecile would put their money online. What are you fucking out of your mind? And all that fucking bullshit. How can I spend it? And no one's going to take it, and you're fucking batshit crazy. And uh, it took me another five years before I really took a look at it and started dabbling more seriously. A friend of mine who got off pretty good, he said, here, he gave me all these coins and said, learn how to trade. And I remember after like four months, I threw it back at him. I said, go fuck yourself. I can't learn how to trade. I don't know what the fuck in this shit is. This is fucking fake internet money. And eventually I was able to understand what I was looking at. You know, I, you put a few thousand hours fucking staring at something, you eventually figure it out. So... Not ground floor, but I got in pretty decent. Awesome question. Thanks, ASG. Anybody else have any more questions for Barry? Um, Brian? I want to throw a shout out to Brad there. Uh, 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 I, I noticed like uh, he's going to be uh, live on Twitch 1 p.m. Pacific time on uh, when is it? Sunday. Uh, Sunday. Sunday. 1 8, 1 p.m. So. And he's going to um, have DJ collab. And if you've never watched him when he has a DJ collab, you're missing out because it's so much fun to watch him play. And then the DJ is working um, and playing music at the same time. It's really an awesome setup. So I highly recommend it. There you go, a bunch of, uh, he's going to play 4K free roll, $12,500 WPT win main event qualifier and best bet Jacksonville uh, WPT 6K package event. So I I love that that they're doing those now where you can, you know, once again, maybe win a seat to these uh, big tournaments. So that's really, uh, that's really pretty cool. It's very Uh, cool. And speak of... The man himself, Mr. Brad, Big Brain Brad. Appreciate the shout out. You guys, you guys are too kind. I love your guys' spaces. Uh, big shout out to Barry. Uh, uh, Slay touched on it. I didn't really know Barry the person. You know, we kind of all know Barry the character in the spaces, and he's hilarious. And it was really nice to actually get to know him and some of his background. Uh, so, big shout out to Barry to opening up to everybody and uh, Sherry and Brian hosting the spaces. It was great and. Um, it's been a great listen. Thank you for bringing me up, and thank thanks for the plug. Thank you, Brad. You know you're always welcome here, bud. Um, Ruben, go ahead, buddy. Welcome. Hey, how's everyone doing? Good. How are you, pal? Great. Good. Uh, so I don't really have many questions for uh, Barry. I know enough about Barry to uh, love Barry. I just wanted to come in and give my uh, respect to the number one hatchet man in the, in, in the, on the internet. Uh, so I, I do, I don't have a question, but I do have a little uh, tidbit. So uh, when I would stream, one of my streaming names was nice game, nice people, uh, which is actually something I heard Barry say uh, in the early two thousands. Uh, when I was going to, well, we were playing in the same game or I was going to his game. I don't remember. But uh, yeah, uh, I can confirm that Barry is uh, really funny and a great host. And uh, yeah, number one hatchet man. Love you, Barry. Oh, that's awesome. What a nice trip that you used to saying. Thanks, Ruben. Yeah, it's, I feel like like all my shit's been stolen all over these, all, all these years. Well, it, <laughs> People like Matt Savage like to break my balls. How I got keep getting triggered over Eden, and it's like everything <laughs> this fucking guy says like is twenty years old for me. Like with his mar- <laughs> with, with his with his marching bands and and fucking <laughs> his music. And I, I ran a tournament in two thousand eight, and they had the Harlem Boys Choir marching band. They had the Cirque du Soleil dancers hanging from the ceiling. They had the Rockettes going around, and in the middle of the fucking tournament, all of a sudden, you hear fucking music playing, and I'm looking around, and I'm saying, where the fuck is this music coming from? And it's a piano, 
and I go closer and closer. There was like 50 tables, and there's this guy standing there playing the piano, and I'm just like saying, wow, this fucking guy is amazing. And the following, like two weeks later, he won like 11 Grammys. It was John Legend. What was, an honor. Wow. That's so, a- yeah. All the shit that, and the hatchets. I got a hatchet story if you want to hear it. Of course. This was after Frank got killed in 2009, and they try to restart the clubs again. Well, that's when Frank got killed. But one of my bosses in a, one of the clubs, his name was Vinny Limo, they called him. He was a construction guy, bookmaker, and he had a situation where he was did some contract work for a guy, and he sent one of his employees to go pick up the money, and... Like a good DJ, and the guy went, he picked up the money, ended up taking it to Atlantic City and blowing it. And it never got back to my friend, Vinny. And he's a multi-million dollar construction guy, half a wise guy. He didn't want to finish the job because he considered it like he didn't get paid. So the guy, they showed up at his, cl- his club and they stuck him with a knife and said, you're going to pay this fucking money. And he called for a a sit-down. And he goes to a sit-down, and of course it's ruled against him because he sent his own guy to pick up the money. It's not nobody else's fault, but this guy ran away. And he wasn't happy, and he's like, you don't give a fuck. He's not paying it. And sure enough, a couple weeks later, two guys show up. They grab him. They chase him around the table with a hatchet. And they fucking go to swing at him, and he reaches down to try and block it. And they whack his fucking wrist off, his hand off at the wrist. And it was, I could just picture him laying in the hospital bed as they're sewing it back on, riding on everyone. How? You know, I'm not an expert on this stuff, Sherry, but owing a construction guy named Vinny in New York money does not (laughs) seem. Very good for your health. Doesn't have a safer health than you. I can't agree he's more. Like, he's like, oh my gosh, this is not good for your health. That's probably worse than having a like stroke, Barry. Like, ASG, go ahead. Yeah, I've got some old New York questions for you. Uh, you know, like, did you did you go to Woodstock or you ever at CBGBs or any of those famous protests? Yeah, like that kind of thing. Yeah, I've. Went to a lot. I never Woodstock now, but all those old clubs. You know, it was big in the '80s, Limelight, and all, all those different places like that. Nice. All right, I see your nephew Neil is back with us. Neil, give us something that we would never know about Barry because he would never. Yeah, we want. Talk. We want the dirt, Neil. Come on. Give us a good story about your uncle, Neil. Yeah, you know, what you see is what you get with Barry. Um, he's just a genuine uh, good guy. Um, you know, you don't want to cross him, but he's just a good guy. And I really hope you that he takes you up on this, the writing a book about all his stories, because he has so many. And I'd hate those to disappear one day. Um, they They really need to see the light. And just any time I've been with him at casinos around the country, whether it's in Atlantic City or uh, Hollywood, uh, Florida, people always know him anywhere he goes. And, you know, he's not like a popular name on television, but it it doesn't matter because of his look and his demeanor and how he talks to people and his, his humor. Like, there's always somebody that comes up to us. And they're like, hey, Barry. And he starts talking. Ten minutes go by. The person walks away. And he looks at me. He goes, I have no fucking idea. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> Almost every that. time. It's like, I have no idea who that was. But he's always, like, friendly and kind to anybody that walks up to him. And, yeah, I, you know, if you ever have a chance to meet Barry, you definitely should. Well, I look forward to it. And hopefully it won't be too many uh months away from now i'm glad you joined us neil um for sure um i think it's an it's a true testimony as to 
Barry's character that his nephew made it a point to come and join us tonight. So I think that speaks volumes as to who Barry is as a person, and it is awesome. Uh, I know I speak for all of us in this room that we've really enjoyed getting to know him in these spaces, and we consider him a friend now. And, of course, our our resident hatchet man. Hatchet man. <laughs> <laughs> that was a literal hatchet story. Right. I, I, sent, I sent ASG the article about the hatchet guy. Oh, my goodness. That's, so it's great. awesome. Go ahead, Brian. Oh, I don't, I don't have anything else, Sherry. I'm good, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Brad. Uh, if I can, I, I got a live poker shout out I'd like to get for somebody we got on the panel. Uh, Mr. Ruben in a $400, one milli guaranteed bag, heaps of chips on day Let's one. Let's go. Let's fucking go, Ruben. Oh, Ruben. So. That's awesome, dude. Congrats. Take that. Thank you, thank you. All right, I'm going to try and make a run. Thank you, uh, Brad. That's and awesome. Brad. I've been Let's traveling, so I haven't kept up with anybody's. Uh, what anybody's doing today but i'm um, sorry i didn't know that already go ruben yeah let's fucking go man hell yeah well i don't have any more questions if uh anybody else on the panel if not i'm going to tell barry thank you so much for joining us uh appreciate getting to know you a little bit better yeah thank you for having me it's always a pleasure and we'll talk yeah. about the thing bud I'm serious. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's pretty cool, Sherry. I love it. All right, thank you everybody for joining us. Thanks, guys. For, uh, your comments and questions and emotions. Love you all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank everyone. you. Goodbye. Good night.